<laughs> hey guys. Uh, thanks for having me here. I'm a bit of a different person, actually. And as much as said, I'm going to give a little bit of an off-topic talk. So, um, well, yes, the, the talk is named What Would Tomster Do? And the idea is to try and see some situations that you, as web developers, as native app developers, iOS and Cocoa developers, uh, might face and see how we, in the single-page uh, app development world, uh, we tackle those problems and try to make some, yeah, widen your views, be with me. Uh, you're going to see some JavaScript this morning. Ooh. So I'm Julian. You can find me on Twitter and, and GitHub. And to give you a little bit of a background, I graduated in 2004 as an engineer in the printing industry. And my first job was actually a Cocoa Mac OS X application developer. So. Uh, but I transitioned from the Objective-C uh, programming language that I really liked to the Ruby uh, programming language. And I did this because I found some interesting similarities between those two languages. Then I moved to the web, web app development world with Ruby on Rails. And I followed somebody called Yehuda Katz that you might know, who was one of the core committers of Ruby on Rails. And he created Ember.js in 2012, if I remember correctly, or 11, maybe. And nowadays, I build single page applications with the UI built with Ember.js and the back end and the API built with Ruby on Rails. So who's Tumster? Tumster is this little nice uh, hamster, and it's the mascot of the Ember.js uh, UI framework, framework sorry. And it defines itself as a framework for creating ambitious web applications. So we're in the web here. So just to let me know who knows Ember.js here. No, that's not a lot. <laughs> OK. Uh, Ember.js actually is the hair of Sprout Core, which is an Apple technology that was used to build MobileMe and a bit later iCloud, if I'm correct. And this guy is named Tom Dale. And he's the other creator of the Ember.js UI framework. He works with Yoheda Katz, and he was an Apple employee. And you might know some of those applications that has been built with the Ember.js framework. LinkedIn, obviously, uh, PlayStation Now. Mobile, um, Apple Music has an interface in Ember.js as well. I need to talk with um, our president speaker. Intercom, the Heroku dashboard, and we've got a uh, Trainline EU uh, speaker today, and their interface, their web interface, is built with Ember.js. So for the first scenario, that problems that you might have and that we have as well in our world, how do we lay out the project? How do we, what's the tooling and what boilerplate code do we have to write to start a project? In Cocoa, you might uh, decide to structure your project with an MVC structure. You might want to use Xcode templates. And we've just seen a very interesting talk about Playground and how the interface automatically loads after modifying the code. So we've got this as well in our world. Ember.js actually comes with a tool called Ember CLI. You use it in the, in the terminal. And Ember CLI is here to enforce uh, convention over configuration that is baked in the Ember.js mind and community. It gives you a common project structure, gives you code generators, and live reload, just like play Playground. So for convention over configuration, actually, like I said before, Ember.js is a very opinionate, opinionated framework and has a strong philosophy. Every decision made in the community is thoroughly discussed uh, through RFCs, and when you get the framework, you have everything installed. You don't get to choose what part of the framework you want or don't want. You ha don't have to build it yourself. For example, you've got the URLs updated automatically, and it represents the state of the application. You've got the uh, file structure. Every, every uh, developer that starts a new application actually um, st starts the project with this line and gets this hierarchy, and it's the same for all the developers. So when you move from one project to another, you don't have to find your way through the project. You uh, gain time, and you know where your models are, when your controllers are, and everything. 
as for code generators, with one line as well, of course, you get the product. Here we're, we're creating a route, which uh, helps us map the URL between the, uh, through the application state. And we've got, it's going to build a product JS in the, in the route temp, uh, directory. It's going to build a template. It's going to modify the router um, file to insert text in there, code in there. And it's going to um, create the test automatically for you to make sure that you've got everything already set up and you don't have to create those manually. And as for live reload, when you want to try your Ember.js application, you start a server, you open your browser on this URL, you edit your code with the text editor of your choice, Atom, Sublime, Emacs, BB Edit, whatever, and just like we saw with Playground, the browser will automatically reload and you don't have to hit any key. So if you keep those two views, uh, one aside to the other, you'll modify the code and see the changes right away. As for the second scenario, uh, when you build a native iOS app, you often have to plug into an API, and cut it on a, on a different server, and use a backend. And Ember.js apps and single page web applications are just the same. So how do you handle this? On Coco, you might have to update it. Well, what I didn't say is that how do you reflect the changes on the data that happens on the model to the UI? With Coco, you might update the controller manually, do this manually in the controller to update the UI. Or you might use key value observing, or you might use Rx Swift. And we'll have a talk about this today, I believe. In Ember, we've got HTML bars templates. And we just consume a variable that has a first name and a last name. And, and it's going to build the HTML. It's going to interpolate the values and build the HTML. This user variable was created inside the controller. And the controller defines the, t the context. So here we created a user called John Doe. This is the important part. In the model, if we want to have a computer called the full name that uses the first and the last name to concatenate those two values, well, then we give the code to concatenate the values. And what's important here is that we use something called a computed property. And we say explicitly that the full name needs to know the changes of the first and the last name. So whenever, some, for some reason, those two values are modified, well, then the full name will be recomputed and the changes will be reflected. So in the UI, we can refactor and use the full name to get the same func functionality that we had before. But now what happens if the user interacts with the UI and modifies the model? Well, then, if I get the mouse, you see that the the UI automatically reflected the changes. Oh, Mr. Nee. This is automatically done, and we didn't have to write any boilerplate code or glue code. The only thing that we did is define this computed property and tell our code that it depended on the first and the last name. OK, and one last scenario that's going to uh, remind us about what we saw about playing ground before as well is how do we test the UI when we don't have an API? And we saw Brendan do some code about this before. We are building UIs. We rely on APIs in the end in the protection code. But when building the UI, sometimes the API is not finished. It's not even started sometimes. But it would be nice to test the UI and make sure that all the edge cases are good, long strings, and everything we saw before. In Coco, you might use OHHTP stub, Nocilla, and I should add Playground. In the Ember world, we use Ember CLI Mirage, and it defines itself as build, test, and demo your app using a client-side server. This is a bit of a strange way, but we're running a server inside the client application. With, with Mirage, you define your endpoints. You say, my UI will have to post to authors, or it will have to get authors, or put or delete whatever URLs you need your UI will need. You create factories for your models. You stub models. Here, we are stubbing an author model, and we're giving fake values for email, first name, last name, and even a fake URL for its avatar image. 
And we're doing this with these fake um, values. Every time you reload the browser, you'll get different values. Shorter, shorter strings, longer strings. I haven't uh, used localization with this kind of strings, but I believe it's doable as well. So you can really thoroughly test your UIs with different strings, just like what Brendan showed us before. Then you define your model structure. You say that, you say that a post belongs to an author. And in the end, you can seed your development database. And here we create one author, and we create 10 posts that belong to this author. So when you start your Ember application in the develop development environment and uh, load those screens, you will see the fake data that was created just before. And what's even more interested, in interesting is that in your acceptance test, so an acceptance test is like complete stack test. You test the UI and you simulate the user interactions. You can as well see the test database. Here we create 10 authors. And you instruct the browser to go visit such a URL and then make sure that in the DOM, you'll find 10 images with the avatar class that reflects all the, all the authors that we created before. And something very interesting as well is that the API you plug into might not all the time be very responding. You might get uh, the API, API might be lagging, or you might get uh, error codes back from the API. So if you want to test your UI, to make sure that you can handle those differences, those problems, you can do it as well. You can specify uh, a, a timing response, and you can choose what kind of HTTP status codes the API might return and make sure that your UI complies to this. Well, thank you. That's all for this uh, a bit of off-topic talk. If you've got any questions, of course. And you can find the slides here if you want to. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you, Julien. Yeah, as you said, it's really, really funny to see that uh, this this tool, this approach of the live reload that is been that has been around since I mean a long time on the web, since, yep. and is kind of of coming to us like with playgrounds and with the approach as Brandon showed us. It's really interesting to see these these kind of convergence. A lot of similarities between playground and what yeah. I do actually. Yeah. Yeah. So, but with a, with a live reload, we can go even further. So, and it's really quick. So, I hope uh, playground is going to be that way. Uh, just a first question that I think maybe all the crowd is is wondering is, uh, have you ever met uh, Tomster? No, 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 actually not. Oh, uh, but okay. I need to buy the um, the little the um, mascot. Mascot. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, um, so um, there are lots of things that we would like, like to pick from this uh, approach and these frameworks. Um, but uh, and there is anything that you would like to have back from the Cocoa world that you had back at the time? Uh, it's, been, it's been quite a long time, actually. 2004 and five, I was building uh, Western applications. Uh, what do I miss the most? Steve Jobs. But I, I believe that's oh. that's what I was about to say. But we all miss him. I, I think. Uh, I, I don't X really miss Xcode. Xcode actually. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, all right. So um, you, you showed there is a uh, this approach by Amber. So it's like to uh, um, uh, so you have everything which is bundled in basically in Amber. So uh, you. Most important dependencies are given by the, the framework. The stack is in, in there by default. Yeah. Uh, do you um, see any inconvenience of doing that? Like, is there any time you would like to say, oh, uh, you would like to say, okay, we we'll like to cherry pick, uh, mix and match other things? Actually, it's a like I said in the convention over configuration, it's very uh, opinionated. So as long, it, and it's the same for Ruby on Rails, actually. The same um, philosophy is in there. You get a lot of stuff that has been decided by the community. As long as you comply to those decisions, the world is great. But when you want to uh, stray away a bit from what's been decided for you, because it's a bit how it is, then you start to have problems. Yeah, and it's a bit harder to completely cherry pick. So you have to decide a bit beforehand sometimes. And if you want to cherry pick all the way through your project, then you might have to go with React, which is the other way of doing things. 
Yeah, the, the idea is to be really fast and really uh, simplify the life of 90% uh, of the developers of the use cases and for the 10% uh, remaining then... There's some work to do. Okay. Yes. Okay, it's, it's a bit the same, I guess, with the, the approach. When, when we write, write some native applications and when you want to go off track and use some maybe some uh, custom UI, then it starts to be uh, painful. Like you don't have these uh, all the, the free features that... Apple could bring uh, in the future, and that's a bit the same. Uh, I idea. believe even when you get to choose everything, uh, when your application becomes more complex, these kind of problems are raised, and you always have to face and and make some harder code. I'd say. 